Hi everybody, it's Webby. Welcome back to another video. Uh, today's car is the 2021 Sanyong Rexton Ultimate. First time I've had a Sanyong on the channel, so really keen to see what the brand is all about. Uh, also in today's video is the maiden outing for my branded logo on my polo shirt. What do you reckon? Um, it's only for a bit of a laugh to be honest, and it looks a little bit smarter than just wearing a normal t-shirt. Um, so yeah, thought I'd get myself a branded logo t-shirt. Um, hopefully you like it. Anyway, onto the car. So, it's a 2021 Sanyong Rexton Ultimate. It's a larger sized family seven seat SUV. Ultimate means it's top of the range, so it's full of equipment, lots of gadgets, all the luxury items you'd expect on a top of the range car. But the good thing about this car is it not only is it packed with full of features, but it's the price tag. This car is just under $55,000 drive away, which is absolutely amazing, because as I show you around the car, and I show you all the features and tech and infotainment bits and pieces that it's got, you'll actually wonder how much car you can get for that sort of money. Nowadays, cars have gone up in price because of COVID and that type of thing, and normally $55,000 doesn't actually get you very much. But in the case of this car, it actually gets you a hell of a lot. So join me for the walk around and first look at the Sanyon Rex and Ultimate um, and let me know at the end what your thoughts are. So let's have a look at the styling on the outside of first of all. I'll do a quick walk around and show you what I think of the outside. I actually do think this is quite a good looking car. That big bold front grille at the front of the car, when you look at it in your rear view mirror, it's kind of like shouts, get out of my way. But I actually think it's quite a chunky, aggressive looking styling for the car. Um, so coming around the side, now if you shut your eyes and don't look at the Sanyong badge, have a look at those sort of rear wheel arches and front wheel arches. To me, it looks like a previous generation Toyota Kluger. Um, maybe it's just my eyes playing tricks on me, but yeah, if you took the front grille off, that says previous gen Toyota Kluger to me. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, because Toyota sold plenty of Klugers, and the styling didn't, certainly didn't put people off. Now looking at the back of the car, again, quite a handsome beast. Um, probably not the, uh, the prettiest car out there, but it's certainly sort of quite chunky and aggressive, and sort of fairly chiseled, if you like, I suppose you'd call it. Um, but yeah, it's not a bad effort, because normally your Korean companies can be a little bit sort of, I don't know, sometimes they're a bit wacky, sometimes they're a bit safe. You'd probably say this kind of errs on the side of being a little bit safe, but actually it's quite a good looking car. And certainly better than some of the other efforts that Sanyong have had over the years, because they've had some absolute shockers. But whoever designed this gives a, gets a big thumbs up from me, I reckon. Now, Sanyong is the third biggest car maker in South Korea, obviously after Hyundai and Kia. But when you look around this car, it looks like they've actually borrowed some parts from Hyundai and Kia, particularly things like the engine, the gearbox, some of the switch gear, some of the buttons inside. So whether they've had some sort of partnership um, in getting parts for this particular car wouldn't surprise me, because it does feel a little bit Hyundai slash Kia um, in a lot of its parts and bits and pieces around the car. Starting off with the engine, under the bonnet there's a 2.2 litre turbo diesel four cylinder engine with an eight speed automatic gearbox. The engine puts out 147 kilowatt and 441 newton meters of torque. So plenty of power, plenty of guts, keep this car moving at a pretty decent pace. Fuel consumption is rated at 8.9 litres per 100, and I've been getting about 10 and a half uh, in all the different driving styles that I've been doing. A lot of that has been around town to and from work and to the shops, but I've also done a bit of freeway in there as well. Um, so 10 and a half isn't too bad, um, but for a diesel engine, yeah, maybe you would expect it to be a little bit better, um, but maybe if you're doing lots of longer journeys, then obviously that would come down a fair bit. Right, so let's have a look at the inside of the Rexton. As we open the door, immediately you can see it looks very luxurious inside here. Uh, lots of leather and aluminium trims everywhere. Now let's just start on the door here. So you've got things like this nice sort of padded leather with stitching here, uh, and even on the top of the door panels as well, it looks really nice. When you come along, you've got this lovely sort of brushed aluminium surrounds for things like the memory positions for the seats. Uh, you've got a speaker there as well. 
We've got another speaker grill down the bottom, again in a nice aluminium finish. Uh, the seats are really, really comfortable. Uh, again, you've got this nice sort of diamond stitching down the sides of the seats. The centre of the seats are perforated because the seats are heated and air conditioned. Uh, again, $55,000, absolutely blows your mind. Coming down, we've got all the electric switches there for the seats. Uh, obviously, I mentioned the memory positions a minute ago. And then up there, we've got a sunroof. Unfortunately, it's only a smaller size roof. Um, would have been nice to see a bigger sunroof. I guess that would have mean a bit of an increase in price, but you know, I thought I'm sure people would have happy spent a little bit more to get a pan panoramic sunroof. Now coming to the dashboard side of things, we've got a lovely leather steering wheel here, which is actually flat bottomed. Buttons over this side for things like your radio, your phone. Uh, this side you've got your cruise control and then some buttons operate the screen in front of the driver. Uh, we've even got paddles here as well. Uh, the gear, st gear selector paddles, which is unusual for something like this type of car. Indicators are actually on the left. So anyone who's driven a European car, including me, uh, will be quite used to having indicators on the left hand side. Uh, digital display in front of the driver, uh, which is nice and clear, easy to read. Uh, and then when you switch it off, you get that lovely logo, a little animated display in front of the car. That's actually quite cool, I like that. So in the centre of the screen, uh, we've got the infotainment display there. It's not one of the really sort of big widescreen ones, but it does the job perfectly well. It doesn't have built-in satellite navigation, so you do have to use your phone, be it your iPhone or an Android phone, uh, to actually use SatNav, um, which is not a problem because most people you know, plug their phone, phone in these days, including me. Um, there is one gripe when you use an Apple CarPlay though, is the buttons are normally this side of the screen to get your quick access buttons, but for some reason they're over here, and the screen does feel slightly tilted towards the passenger, which is really odd. Um, not quite sure why they've done that, but anyway. Um, then just below that, you've got all the traditional controls for your air conditioning and climate control. Uh, you've got dual zones as well, which is nice um, for obviously having separate temperatures for driver and passenger. Just below that, we've got heated and air conditioned seats for driver and passenger as well, which is really nice, particularly here in Australia um, when you get a hot day. Uh, just below that, you've got wireless phone charging as well. We've then got a couple of USB charging points there as well. Uh, some cup holders with a nice little lid to hide secure, uh, items if you're not in your car. Uh, gear stick feels a little bit BMW in the fact that it rocks backwards and forwards when you select your gear. Uh, we've got obviously the usual buttons down here, so drive select mode, sensors, cameras, electronic handbrake and auto hold function, uh, and then a the button there for parking. Now with the camera button, when you press that, I'll show you what happens there. So it brings up the cameras that are on the car, so you've got one at the front and one at the back. And it gives you a couple of options here as what you want to actually see. So the minute we're using the front camera, if you hit that one, you've got the right hand uh, side of the car. You've then got a wide view at the front, and then you've got full range. You can actually adjust um, sort of what angle you want the camera to look at. And if we press it again, then we can flick to the back. Again, you've got the same options, full range, wide view. So again, that's better for parking. And then again, you can switch over to the right-hand side of the car. But you can also change how you want the view to be as well. So you've got a 3D mode there as well, which is actually pretty cool. And then with your finger, you can literally just twist it like that and get an outside view, like an aerial bird's eye view of the car. So again, helps when you're parking. Oh. Being a rear passenger in the Rexton, you don't actually miss out on too much, to be honest with you. You've got still not nice leather seats. There's plenty of room to stretch your legs out. And your feet actually fit under the driver's seat as well. So on a longer journey, you can stretch out, relax, and enjoy the ride. We still get all the nice sort of soft leather touch in here on the doors, and also the soft touch materials on the top of the doors. And a really nice feature is in the back, the outer two passengers have got a heated seat as well. Again, it's another touch that comes from Hyundai and Kia. So you can definitely see they've shared some parts between the three brands. Not that that's a bad thing, because having heated seats in the back of a car is actually quite nice in the winter. Now in the middle, it's good to see a couple of air vents, and there's also a couple of USB charging points, uh, and also a 12 volt socket as well. 
In between the two middle seats, we've obviously got the standard fold down armrest with a couple of cup holders there, which is nice. But also there's a little cubby hole in there as well. So if you've got any bits and pieces you wanna sort of store away without them flying around the back of the cabin, that's actually a neat little idea. Headspace is actually really good. Um, even someone who's sort of six foot tall would be quite happy sat back here, I reckon. There's only probably a couple of negatives in the back here. The middle seats don't slide backwards and forwards like I do in most seven seat SUVs. So you can't adjust the amount of foot room that people in the third row get. The other one is the fact that you don't get the panoramic sunroof that I mentioned earlier. It does feel a little bit sort of dark and claustrophobic in the back here. Um, although it's nice, you've got decent sized side windows, you get a great view out the front of the car and obviously you do get a bit of light coming in from the sunroof. It would have been nicer for the sunroof to sort of come back here so you get much more light coming in um, as you're driving along. So access to the third row is easy enough. You have to fold up uh, the middle row seat just here uh, and then enables you to get into the back. Uh, so let me just climb inside and I'll show you what it's like. Oh. As you can see, you don't get a whole lot of knee room and leg room back here, uh, which as I mentioned earlier, if you were able to slide that middle row forward, it would actually make space in the back a lot better for third row passengers. Also in the third row, you do get air conditioning controls and air vents as well, but they're located on the driver's side rear section. Um, so instead of coming down from the ceiling, the air vents are over on the right hand side, which is really odd because you kind of have to adjust the fans so the person on the left hand side of the car can actually feel the air conditioning which is a little bit odd to be honest um, however you do get a 12 volt power socket there and a little storage area there as well which is quite handy there's a really decent sized boot when you've got only five seats in place uh, and this section here is actually adjustable so you can have a little bit of storage underneath which then also gives you a flat load floor where you can actually lift it up and obviously access bits and pieces there as well. The other trick you can do is this slots down there. So you can either stop things from moving around in the back of the car and obviously fling into the boot uh, or vice versa you can stop stuff flying into the back of the car. Um, so that's actually quite a nifty idea. And even more good news, this car comes with a seven year unlimited mileage warranty and the first seven services are only $375 each, so they're fixed for seven years or 105,000 Ks, which is absolutely fantastic. The other good news is that you can actually tow up to three and a half tonnes with this car as well. Um, so if you've got a big boat, caravan, horse float, this will do the job for you. So now the next step is to actually take it out on the open road and see how it drives. Um, because it's all very well and good having all the tech and the luxury and the comfort and everything else. But obviously a big part of a car is actually how it drives and behaves on the open road when you get it out. And it's just as important obviously for the driver as it is for all the passengers as well. So it's not just about you know how fast does it go, what's the fuel consumption like. But you've got to consider your passengers as well. Um, so the second and the third row, are they comfortable? You know, is it going to make them car sick and stuff like that? So there's a lot of things to consider um, when you're looking at a car like this. Now, strangely enough, when I first got in the car, my initial sort of like driving experience was it had a lot of travel on the accelerator, as in you put your foot down a couple of inches before it actually did anything, before it actually started to move the car, um, which felt a bit strange at first, I've got to be honest, because I'm not used to that in any other car that I've driven. And it took me a couple of days to get used to it. At first, I really didn't like it. Um, it was quite sort of alien, and it was all like, you know, you're just waiting for it to do something. Um, but the longer I sort of, I've been driving the car, and the more I've got used to it, I've actually kind of adjusted, I suppose, my driving style. Um, so I'm kind of driving around the issue, I suppose, if you like. But once you, so yeah, the initial kind of takeoff does feel a little bit kind of like lacking in response. But once you actually get going and you're up into sort of second and third gear, it actually drives really well. Um, it's just that kind of initial takeoff that you kind of have to 
um, almost feather the throttle a little bit to actually sort of make for a smooth acceleration. The visibility as you're driving along is really good. Um, obviously the front windscreen is a decent size. All the side windows are really good. We've got the blind spot monitor as well. That helps obviously when you're on the freeway and overtaking and dual carriageways and that type of thing. So essentially it's an easy car to drive. It's, it's, uh, it's no more difficult than any other seven seat SUV. Things you will notice though, is definitely is its DNA from being a dual cab ute. So where they've kind of obviously, you know, a dual cab ute, you've got a suspension set up that is designed to sort of be used when the car's empty plus also when it's carrying a load. It feels that the suspension is very similar in this car because it's got 20 inch wheels, which obviously are, you know, do have some effect on sort of the riding quality of the handling. And you sort of do feel it when you sort of hit a bump and that type of thing. So it's firm in that respect. But then on the flip side, if you sort of have to brake quite harshly, the front nose does dip down a fair bit. So it's almost like it's, it's, it's hard suspension, but it's softly sprung. And it's a strange sort of sensation. You do have to get used to it. And the brake pedal is a little bit soft as well. So those two combined, you kind of have to start braking a little bit earlier than you might do in another car, just because you kind of you're trying to sort of, I guess, level out the handle and you don't want it to sort of dive too much under braking. You're trying to make it for a smooth driving experience for obviously your passengers. So you maybe just have to think a little bit about actually your driving style. Or well, certainly, well, that's what I found anyway, because, you know, if you don't, it can be sort of a little bit sort of uncomfortable and a bit jerky, jerky and a bit sort of wallowy when you're going around the corners. It's fairly quiet inside the cabin, not a lot of road noise gets through, not too much wind noise gets into the cabin. So they have done a really good job with the sound insulation, which is nice. I've noticed with this, um, with the driving position, it's a nice, um, you know, sort of everything's dead straight, there's no sort of off-centre pedals or steering wheel or anything. But even though I'm only five foot seven, I feel like I'm sitting up really high, and the seat's in its lowest position. Um, so you can't get any, go any lower. So if you had someone who was six foot, six foot plus, they might struggle a little bit in terms of headroom. Um, I mean, oh, okay, I've, like I say, five foot seven, I'm always gonna have plenty of space. But yeah, if you've got someone over six foot, they might struggle because this is the lowest the seat goes. Um, the nice thing with the seating though, is you've got three memory positions on the buttons over here on the door. So you can actually store different seat positions for three drivers. Um, which is actually quite a nice feature. Now, the turning circle is actually quite good on this car. It's such a big car, it turns quite easily and it's kind of, you know, you're not doing too many three point or five point turns to try and get around, you know, it's a sort of fairly tight road. But you do notice lock to lock, um, you have to sort of turn the steering wheel quite a number of times to actually get a full lock, um, whichever way you're sort of turning the wheel. Now for a car that doesn't cost a whole heap of money, you'd expect a fairly sort of basic sound system in this car. But it's actually got a really good sound system. There's plenty of bass, there's plenty of adjustment on the screen, on the dashboard. Um, and it, it definitely surprised me because I wasn't really expecting much. I thought it'd be sort of fairly tinny and yeah, just not up to the job really. But I have to say I've been quite impressed with the, uh, the quality of the speakers in this car. One question I have been asked quite a lot when uh, I've been speaking to sort of friends and work colleagues is what is it you know they've never seen one of these before on the road and you know you obviously have to spend five minutes explaining what it is who is made by and you know exactly what sort of features you get on the car um, but most people have sort of been fairly um, sort of kind about it they all sort of quite like the look of the styling uh, a few of the guys I work with you know come out to look inside and been really impressed with the fit and the finish um, of the interior and the, you know, the quality of the materials that have been used. Um, so it just goes to show that, you know, the South Korean brands are actually getting better and better as the years go by, which obviously, you know, Hyundai and Kia are definitely a testament to. I've often found myself uh, looking down at the speedo and, you know, you don't realise how quickly you gather pace. 
it's not one of those cars that you know jolts you back in your seat when you accelerate or anything daft like that but you sort of look down the speed and you think oh geez i've got to whatever the speed limit is quicker than you was expecting so yeah it's sort of deceptively quick i suppose the one thing that does disappoint me about the driving experience with this car is actually the lack of adaptive cruise control. You'd have thought for this type of car and you know, yeah, you're only spending $55,000, but even if they said, okay, we're gonna stick adaptive cruise and it's another $500, I'm pretty sure everybody who buys one of these would spend $500 more for adaptive cruise control. Um, because nowadays you can't expect it. You know, you get it in small cars um, you know, that are sort of half the size of this will get adaptive cruise control. Whether that's something they'll bring out in the future, um, who knows, maybe it'll be on a, the next sort of update or facelift. Because yeah, it's just, it's gonna be one of those cars that you do long journeys in with a family. Um, that would be you go on holiday or visit relatives in another state or something. Um, you will be doing long journeys in this car and it just seems such a shame to miss out on adaptive cruise control because yeah, it's um, it's a real disappointing omission, I think. I think the term built for comfort, not speed, is very apt for this car. It's comfortable, it will get you there, you know, fuss or no bother. Um, but yeah, don't try and uh, drive it like a sports car, that's for sure. So I guess the real question is, would you buy one of these? I definitely have to say you've got to put it on your shopping list. If you're in the market for a seven seat family SUV with a decent engine, plenty of equipment and a really good long warranty, then yeah, it definitely has to go on your shopping list. There are a couple of downsides to it. Like I said, no adaptive cruise control, the slightly small screen for the sat nav and the fact that the buttons are on the left hand side of the, the, the Apple CarPlay. Um, for some people, it might not be important. Um, I would personally like the adaptive cruise control i can get around the buttons of the car play you now you get used to that but yeah i'd really like the adaptive cruise control that's one thing that i think uh, is definitely um, a bit disappointing for me personally but in terms of a family car that can seat seven in comfort has plenty of gadgets um, it, here's the nail on the head it really does sort of fill the brief that a lot of people are looking for in a family car um, so yeah for sure really consider one of these and for the money you know you've definitely got to sort of uh, give it strong consideration <clears throat> um so that's the end of this video uh reviewing the 2021 sanyong rexton ultimate um i have to say i've been actually quite impressed with this car it's the first time i've actually reviewed or driven a sanyong um, and i didn't really know what to expect so to get to the end of the week and actually be quite impressed um was something i wasn't really expecting if i'm honest um, because, yeah, for what you get in, for the value for money and what it costs, I didn't have high hopes for this car. Um, but like I say, I've been really impressed with it. The really long warranty, the fantastic equipment level that you get, uh, and also that seven year cap price servicing is a really good proposition for anyone looking for, you know, a high end family car on a budget. If you've got any questions or comments about this car, please leave them in the comments section for me below uh, and I'll come back to you as soon as I can. If you've enjoyed the video, uh, obviously please give it a like and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to find out when the next car review goes live. Uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next one.